Uh, great. Good morning to everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm glad we had a chance to convene such a fantastic panel this morning. It's an outlook uh, and update on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and as Emerging Markets Editor uh, for CNN Business, I, I spent probably a third of my time uh, being based in the UAE uh, looking east, and particularly to the new relationships that have been formed over the last uh, decade, but particularly accelerated over the last five years, and that is the relationship uh, between this region and China, uh, this region and India, and this region uh, going on the spice route down to Southeast Asia as well, and the connectivity using the UAE, and particularly Dubai, uh, between China and reaching down uh, into Africa as well. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has actually gathered a great deal of momentum since I uh, based myself out of Beijing for seven weeks at the start of 2017. Uh, CNN had placed me there in the first 100 days uh, of the current president, uh, President Trump, uh, to see how the relationships between China and the U.S. would be evolving. And one of the key issues that I covered when I was in Beijing for that period of time uh, was the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, the AIIB in, in Beijing. And the narrative from Washington was that uh, the AIIB had aspirations to replace the World Bank. And as time has uh, gone forward, uh, that discussion has faded away. Uh, but there is a political concern about the motivations of the Belt and Road Initiative not just being a development initiative, but one where it ex exercises the power over China over a longer period of time. And it's uh, kind of the giant elephant in the room. But one, this panel is more than willing to address, which I think is, is excellent. Uh, one would have to be blind being based in the UAE, not seeing the depth of the relationship uh, between the Arab world now uh, and China. It's been very strategic over the last 10 years, as I was noting. Uh, but there's an understanding between the two uh, that business can be done east to east. Uh, the tendency in the Arab world, particularly in the Gulf states with their uh, oil uh, sovereign funds, uh, was to look to Europe and look to the United States initially. And, and I think what has changed in the last five years in particular is a willingness uh, to invest uh, in China and to invest in India and have this relationship going back and forth, uh, driven in part by energy, uh, but energy being the, the forging uh, initiative and building uh, the trade relationships and security relationships uh, beyond that. Uh, the ambassador is going to uh, speak in Arabic today, uh, showing uh, the initiative of uh, the, the Silk Road. Uh, he's an Arabic speaker for 40 years, which is very impressive. His English is fluent, and he said his Arabic's even better. <laughs> so even though I, I live in the region, I don't speak in Arabic, he feels extremely confident that his Arabic is uh, uh, better than the Queen's English, right? So we'll, let, we'll leave that to you. <laughs> Thank you, because Great. my... Go ahead, go ahead. So you can get your uh, headset ready, please. What were you saying? Yeah, thank you. Because my uh, my English is still limited, but uh, and all, uh, more more than that, I prefer to uh, to speak in Arabic to respect our owners. Good. Uh, the Deputy Minister of Pakistan, it's good to see you. I just came back from Pakistan for the leaders in Islamabad, uh, and mentioned uh, this again. It was a very important topic: uh, the relationship on the China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, what it means for them in terms of development today, the concerns locally about potential debt and the issue that you'll be addressing on, on that and the opportunity that it holds uh, going forward. Uh, Ryan's uh, a specialist in Asia and a specialist into China, so willing to jump in on many of the debates. And we have a think tank from China as well. It's great to see you speaking fluently uh, in English. Uh, these gooseneck mics are extremely directional, so you have to keep it almost in front of your mouth when we, uh, we have the conversation. So you just, it's very directional. I'm the only one with the Thai mic on. And I want to definitely allow uh, at least 15 minutes for questions. So please take your notes. I would ask you to be very direct because we only have an entire hour uh, together. Uh, Ambassador was going to go with an opening statement, and in, in the back discussion that we had in the green room here, uh, he's going to parse that to 90 seconds, but I promised him I would uh, address all the issues that you brought up. Uh, first and foremost, let's, let's start with the building blocks here for this audience. Uh, it's a very educated audience, obviously, but this is being streamed out as well. Uh, what is the primary goal of the Belt and Road Initiative, which you suggest, Ambassador? Uh, what, what is the primary motivation here as we go forward uh, in terms of the number of signatory countries uh, and then allaying the fears of what the real motivation is here of Beijing? Thank you. Uh, it is very 
important to, to properly read the Belt and Road Initiative, which is known by the acronym BRI. This initiative is an economic initiative. It uh, urges economic development. The initiative covers five axes. First, the exchange of policies, the strengthening of the uh, infrastructure, reinforcing trade, and the trade at the level of the financial uh, in the financial sector that is uh, the exchange of financial investments these five axes do embody this cooperation through the uh, the belt and road initiative the bri bri has been welcomed by various countries we do believe that this is very significant second of all when it comes to the world economic forum which looks into a new cooperative tools and procedures really reflects the spirit of the BRI. The spirit of the BRI is based on tolerance, openness, uh, peace, uh, exchange of uh, um, exchange of experience, uh, cooperation, and all the good uh, behaviors. Through the BRI, we have been able to have big achievements. For example, we have 17 Arab countries. 17 Arab countries have signed cooperative agreements with China to move forward with this initiative. We have 124 countries globally, and more than 200 international organizations have signed these cooperative documents with China when it comes to the BRDI. By the end of this month, we will hold the second session of the global cooperation for the BRI in Beijing. And uh, till now, we we have more than 40 uh, prime ministers and presidents, uh, more than 100 countries will be represented in that uh, forum. This is uh, briefly the main uh, points of the BRI. If I may, uh, with you, and, and thank you for being uh, so direct with that. Is it very important for the, the BRA, BRI <laughs> summit that's taking place now? And I spoke to His Excellency Khaled al Fale of uh, Saudi Arabia yesterday, and he's making it a point to go, even though they have a big finance summit uh, taking place in Saudi Arabia at the same time, to articulate a different, broader message to allay the fears that we see in the West that the dominance of the BRI I is not justified. Is it important for Xi Jinping to make this statement as president today to kind of nullify these concerns? <laughs> As I have mentioned, the spirit of the BRI is to have more cooperation, more collaboration, and more exchange of uh, experience. This is based on our philosophy in China. We believe that the world in the future has to live in peace, uh, to guarantee prosperity for all, tolerance, openness, peace and welfare. This is what China seeks. It's our endeavor. Therefore, any country, if it is willing to participate in the BRI forum, they are the most welcome. We do believe that they will be taking part in this constructive approach. We will have bilateral agreements with the countries in different regions aiming at benefiting from the BRI through collaboration and cooperation. We will be having a state of win-win for all. For the uh, issue of uh, a counterbalance on the argument, let me go to Ryan next and then come uh, to the deputy minister. Uh, because of this BRI summit that's taking place in China in uh, three weeks' time, uh, you, you'd notice the narrative in, in Europe. Uh, we had Xi Jinping come uh, and visit uh, Italy. Uh, my wife happens to be Italian, so I was particularly covering the, uh, the movements quite carefully, both in Trieste and Genoa and the plans in southern Italy as well. Uh, Italy was welcoming to sign on to the BRI, but the narrative out of uh, whether it was Berlin or out of Paris or out of Brussels was very different. So what has shifted uh, on this concern that's being raised in Europe about China, would you suggest, Ryan? Well, John, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I, I think that part of the anxiety about BRI stems from a few different roots. And I appreciated the ambassador's comments, but since we're here, we should be frank with each other. Uh, the first concern is 
the strategic nature of the enterprise. In other words, there are many projects that have a commercial undertone to them, but not all. There are strategic non-commercial efforts underway through the BRI initiative that are causing concerns in the strategic community, not just in the United States, but also through parts of Europe. And I'll offer a few examples. Uh, for example, ports. Ports are the primary uh, vector through which people express their concern. China is investing in ports next to functioning ports that have excess capacity, which raises questions, why would China pour so much money into ports if there are already capacity in those ports? Can I stop you just for a second? Because I'm very concerned. Which ports are you referring to? Well, I'll offer the example of Guadar, which is right next to Karachi. I'll offer the example of Hamantota, which is right next to Colombo. Uh, there's the port in uh, Djibouti that uh, was there's a gap between the way that China described it and the way that it is being used. And so you add all of these up and you, you develop this uh, pattern recognition that there may be more than just win-win cooperation and economic benefit involved in the BRI initiative. The second concern that many people have is debt sustainability. Uh, and it's not just me, the, the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, has warned that uh, incautious loans could lead to balance of payments problems around the world. So that's, that's a real area for concern. And then the third, I would just sort of bask it as a values proposition. Uh, there have been instances where BRI projects have led to corruption, uh, where they have led to uh, lack of transparency about the projects themselves, and where they have uh, uh, led to a degradation of some of the uh, social, labor, and environmental standards that have been built up over, over the years. So I offer that just in the spirit of candor so that we can get it all out on the table. Good. I appreciate that. So the counter argument, because I actually went down to uh uh, to the Piraeus port, uh, and in my coverage for CNN, to look at an example of Chinese investment into a port that was uh, really an awful shape, uh, as you would probably see. And this was an unusual uh, structure because 50% remained with the state and the other 50% remained with Costco. Uh, investment from 300 million euros originally uh, growing to 1.5 uh, billion euros over a span of four years, uh, employing 1,500 Greeks and having five senior Chinese managers into the port. And the trade has gone up sevenfold in a span of less than a decade uh, since they had the initial conversations. So the Greeks would look at this as a win-win. And I think that's what the Italians were looking at. If they can do what they did in Greece uh, to Trieste or Genoa, all the better. So there's two sides to this coin. You'd agree, right? I would agree completely, John. And I, I think it's a mistake to paint with a broad brush. It's not 100% good. It's not 100% bad. My point is simply that we need to be mindful of the concerns that people are raising. Uh, there is the example of Prius. There's also the example of Haifa. Haifa is a port that the United States Navy goes to when it has problems with its ships in the Mediterranean. There are a lot of ports in the Mediterranean to invest in. Uh, Haifa's investment is, is a cause for, for question. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, I know this was an issue because I just came back, as I mentioned, to, from Pakistan in the last uh, uh, four weeks. I had a fantastic visit, and it was really refreshing uh, to hear uh, from Prime Minister Khan and the entire cabinet singing the praises of the need to stick on to development and not get trapped into the uh, 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 confrontation with India. And I think everybody in the West was very pleased to see uh, Prime Minister Khan taking that uh, view. But the, the chief of staffs for the military, the foreign affairs minister, which I did an interview with on stage, the finance minister I did an interview with for CNN, and the prime minister stuck to the script entirely. Uh, this is an important window on the Belt and Road and the China-Pakistan economic corridor. How do you leave the fears that Ryan raised that were still prevalent in Pakistan when I, during my visit, would you suggest? Uh, thank you, John. Um, so there's a couple of angles to this particular question that you ask, but the, uh, I think important thing is what angle do we look at it from? Mm -hmm. uh, a country that has gone to a war on terror uh, against mostly an invisible enemy. We come into power eight months ago and we're scrambling. We have a mountain of debts accumulated by our own government, and I'm not talking about the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or BRI, just the ground reality of Pakistan. Uh, you have a 70% youth bulge that has no jobs. That's 160 million uh, young, angry people. And then you don't have any poverty alleviation plan which, plans, which uh, has any uh, sustained thinking. Then you have, we're 12 on the list of World Bank's indicators for World Bank's countries for uh, climate uh, vulnerability. Now you add all of that with a country that has uh, power outages for more than 72 hours, that has a water issue, and an energy, chronic energy deficit. And then you have the CPEC, which is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the part of the BRI that deals with us. 
and you see opportunity. And you see a new government that is talking to its Chinese counterparts. We also have really good FTA with China, of which we're in the second negotiating phase. The problem in Pakistan was more about a lot of traders being unhappy with the way the FTA has rolled out, and hence the prearranged, uh, as we say, inbuilt agenda to review the FTA. The problem is not at all with the CPEC, because out of the entire CPEC amount which has been invested, or to be invested, which is 62 billion US dollars, only 5.8 billion of that is on loan. The rest is all either IPP mode or in BOT mode. So for us, to be honest, that is not the biggest issue. We have other issues in Pakistan, as I said, homegrown issues from which we're cooperating with China. And why do we see uh, the CPEC or the BRI in Pakistan as a huge success story for us? Number one, we're talking about things that nobody else talks about, vocational skills, mm. training, jobs, industrial parks, uh, special economic zones, women's econ inclusive economic growth. And the two parts of the country that have suffered the worst in the war against terror are Western Corridor on the border with Iran and with Afghanistan. We're developing uh, the CPEC routes through there now, which were not there in the previous government for obvious reasons, because previously it was also only brick and mortar development. Mm. Now we're doing social development poverty alleviation, we're looking at the models that they have used. China was the first country, the only country, which actually concluded its millennium development goals where the rest of us failed ahead of time. So for us, that's where our uh, outlook and focus is. If there's any other question, happy to answer. Okay, let me follow up on, on one in particular. Sure. And I want to circle back to the Gwadar port afterwards because yes. it's so strategic at this stage. Yes. But let's delve into the conversations because it's unusual for a government like China, which has that surplus, to be able to focus on the development you're talking about. Yes. So there's a different narrative than yes. the one that Ryan said. There's a counter narrative, of course, on, on every story. And this is our challenge even in journalism. Mm -hmm. What did the Chinese say? Like, this is a vulnerable part of your country. Let's help you get out of this uh, trap of uh, terrorism linked to poverty. So interesting. Um, this debate came up sometime in August, September 2018, after the new government. It was a direct request by our government to the Chinese government. Uh, that uh, the first phase of the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor development, which was mostly infrastructure, is very useful for linking both the north and the south of Pakistan. But that's not enough. We're building roads all around the country. We have the historical silk routes. But we have a deindustrialization happening in the country for the last 40 years. So it's, ve it's very well to have, as the previous government's, Pakistani government's policy, to have all these uh, brick and mortar constructions happening. But what are you going to do with it? When you have, as I said, 160 million plus people that don't have jobs. So this was our narrative. Mm. And I think uh, I need to laud the Chinese government for actually listening, because there were significant changes being made then. Currently, we're still negotiating. And now CPEC is open to the world. We're actually inviting joint ventures from the rest of the world to come and participate in Pakistan-China projects. And that is going to increase transparency. We've just talked to a couple of French and German companies uh, that were frankly unhappy with us for not inviting joint ventures and investment before. Huh. So for us, the more transparency, the better it is, and which is why we struggle to showcase this to the world. There are different narratives. And if I can come back to uh, Gavadar. Well, it's in very the interesting what you're saying. I'm not e trying to interrupt you, but yeah. the fact that the Chinese opened the door and did the engagement, it, it, it kind of woke up. The, the West to come and invest in Pakistan is what yes. you're saying. Yes, we met the EU ambassador a couple of weeks ago who was uh, frankly unhappy with the way that we had shut oh. out uh, people to, to an investment. And as far Gavadar port is concerned, uh, to be honest, Gavadar port was a political move of the government of Pakistan long before CPEC, simply because that particular part of the country for the last 72 years, it's, it's not a politically correct term, but it, was, it used to be referred to as the Africa of Pakistan. Mm. We stole their resources, the rest of the country, and we never gave them anything in return. So Gavadar is key for the development, Gavadar port of that entire part of the country, which is the biggest chunk of the country and historically underrepresented. Good. I have to come back to you on the idea of the investment from Saudi Arabia and the UAE into the sure. port uh, strategically on the energy side, which has been uh, fantastic. Uh, Wing Ping He, I think it's great because uh, you talked about the bricks and mortars, uh, Deputy Minister, and you're talking about uh, the need for connectivity, because if you don't have connectivity uh, between Asia and the Middle East, then uh, bricks and mortars don't matter. If you want to pick up on the thought why it is uh, on the 5G level uh, in particular that China can help on the Belt and Road. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for having me uh, to join this uh, very wonderful conference. Actually, uh, before I come to the 5G, I think uh, one thing I feel very impressed, that is 
like uh, two years ago or one year ago, uh, whenever I go to join the, some conference talk about uh, this uh, BRI, I need to spend some time to introduce what it is. But now seems not necessary. Everybody knows what is the BRI before it even have uh, other names called the one, uh, one uh, you know, OBOR, yeah. and yes. like uh, what else? Yeah, there are many, many names. Now people think, understand what is BRI. This is a kind of improvement which is, even though this thing is very new, only I think it's uh, less than six years old, but now, as our ambassador just mentioned, has shined with as many as 124 countries, yeah. Italy becoming the newest one uh, when the President Xi Jinping uh, made a trip to Europe, so which is a very fantastic thing. So anyway, uh, now back to this uh, 5G, because yesterday I joined that uh, session talking about the 5G, and even this early morning I watched some video talking about what is the fantastic things in the future when this 5G area comes, which means when some uh, sick uh, you know, uh, the children or kids in Africa, some remote area, and then the doctor city in Beijing or the New Delhi and then the Paris and the, like London can give direct uh, operation, surgery immediately yeah, from because the time is so in, 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 you know, fast. And even when you are trying to go to your, your bathroom and then your toilet knows that you are a man or woman, immediately you get up at you know, different levels of those toilets. So that's the five, 5G, even five minutes later. And then you I'm not will, sure if I really like that. Oh, even five, <laughs> minutes, even five minutes later, see, your mobile will get all those uh, numbers about your, your union, your health situation. Yeah, so, so that's the future. That's the future. But when you, if you want to make this future become a reality, I think the f you should move step by step. So what is the first step? I think it's infrastructure. Can you imagine? If I cannot travel to the beautiful city, the Dead Sea here, if I need to take three days to come here, sorry, I will say no. I cannot join because it's time consuming. So it's not, you know, that easier, convenient. So that's exactly the thing the One Belt, One Road, this BRI, now is focusing on. Focusing on this infrastructure building, connectivity. This is the first connectivity. That's why we have building a lot of ports, like you mentioned. I will come back to your ports issue <laughs> later. So ports like roads, railway, we're talking about when we go to Africa, we're talking about three, this kind of uh, connectivity uh, in the infrastructure area. One is the road, another is the train. Another is uh, aviation, aviation linking those different African countries. Because now the situation is very poor, honestly speaking. So you cannot build on any like uh, industrialization or even improve, like increase the intra trade among African countries. Those are the topics every year the AU summit has been focused on intra trade, intra trade, and economic integration. But we start the infrastructure. How could you? You will repeat this topic every year, every year, go on and on. So I think this connectivity. I think uh, that's why the world now embraced this idea, because now China is saying, we would like to make contribution. We are not holding the flag saying, China first. Or, all right, if China first, no need to uh, give all those money, go to other countries. Yeah, just the, for ourselves, that's enough. And then we just maybe get other countries' things to China, rather than get our things to other countries. So because, of course, win-win. Uh, China is not saying we just give a check uh, any, any country come to get the check and then you, you take it away. Of course, China's company now from this one belt, one road, and then they also go to other countries to build those ports, uh, those railway, all those things. So this win-win. Uh, I think now that we also mentioned the second uh, belt and road uh, summit in Beijing uh, very soon coming on. What's the difference? According to my observation, now it's a second phase for this. Uh, Belt Road BRI, because now it's going to open more to outside the world. For example, uh, two days before I travel here, I joined a meeting uh, with uh, a Pakistan lady. He, she used to be the uh, deputy, I think, uh, deputy secretary general of the UN. Now she has been invited as the member of the International Advisory Committee for this Belt Road Summit. This is the first time I heard before we, we didn't have this kind of international advisory committee for Belt Road Summit. Now it's open. We invited a lot. Yeah, those very high level, uh, those, you know, the wisdom people come to offer uh, their suggestion, their observation for this BI. Another thing is now we are talking about how to cooperate in the third market. 
That's exactly like a quarter port, uh, this uh, China-Pakistan corridor. So we have witness like Malaysia also go to the investment in Qatar and also Saudi, yeah, you know, the rich country from Middle East and also made a big uh, this country. You're starting to sound like Donald yeah. Trump. They have the money. <laughs> yeah, Donald the Saudis Trump is making it. Follow, yes, with his money. Not only buy those McDonald's uh, for those guys in, in the football team, right? Right. <laughs> in, the, in the White House. Okay, I'm going to stop you because you're getting through all your oh, points. Yeah. You promise you wouldn't. I still so. have a lot of points. I know. Here. Go, hold right. on. I've all right. got 30 minutes. You for your call. <laughs> uh, as Hildi Schwab will tell you, I'll make sure your issues are covered. I've been doing it for a while. Um, right. I want to follow up on a key point, though. Isn't it the reality, though, uh, Wenping, that China plays a very long game? It's not worried about the election cycles that America is faced with or the European election cycles. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that the Belt and Road Initiative plays perfectly into a 100-year game that China's playing and not a four-year election cycle in the United States. Isn't that the political reality? Oh, I don't think that way. You know, our I know you don't think that way, but a lot of people do think that way. Oh, <laughs> it's not that long vision, 100 years <laughs> later. You know, our life uh, fantasy is just uh, 70 years, something like that. Anyway, but uh, I think, uh, like our friends just mentioned, uh, some of uh, those uh, different narratives about BI, that's very natural, very natural. Nothing in the world is perfect. You see, especially this uh, BI, this idea just been there for uh, five years more. So of course, all the way when it's go abroad to do those uh, projects, and then some may be facing a lot of challenge, risky. And the Chinese enterprises also takes time to learn how to abide by the local environment, local law. So a lot of challenge, even at home, like me come from the think tank. Before the very first year, lots of think tank just to want to figure out what is the meaning for things for this BI. But now they also enter into the second phase, that is trying to make a case-to-case -case study to explore what kind of challenge for this BI. Because this is also thanks for the think tank coming from uh, U.S. from European countries because you remind us yeah, all those things like why you pick up the strategic port rather than others and actually there are many ports construction not only those ports you just named out like Qatar or like uh, Djibouti uh, here and there many. But, but, but Wang Ping you would agree with Ryan's point and Ryan please mm -hmm. jump in I'd love to have the deputy minister as well. Yeah. Uh, you, you would agree that those aren't done only for business reasons then. Mm -hmm. I, if a I, port I is at overcapacity and you're deciding to invest, mm -hmm. it does raise a legitimate question that Ryan's bringing up. Why is China doing it then? I think according to my observation, because I'm not coming from uh, this uh, official uh, level, but I think uh, because BRI has been written into our ruling party, Communist Party's this charter, you know, ever since uh, 19th Party's Congress, because we written in. So it has been served as a guiding a guiding uh, principle, guiding strategy for China's like, uh, integration with the whole of the world. So maybe from that perspective, you can see this BRI is a long-term vision. Yeah, if from some perspective. So you do agree with me? There is a no, no, no. Plan. This is just the so. one, one indicator. One indicator. If things written in some things on the paper, that's the mean it's real. Huh? That's the means becoming the real. I think so too. I th Brian, let's get Ryan into the debate and then we'll bring it to the other panelists. Go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you for your comments, okay. Wenping. I, I think they were great. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my, my thought on this is I agree that the Belt and Road Initiative is not going anywhere. It's written into the Chinese Communist Party's constitution, it's embedded in the legacy of Xi Jinping. As long as President Xi is in power, the Belt and Road Initiative is going to drive forward. Full stop. That's my expectation. However, I do think that the Belt and Road Initiative is going to need to change. It's going to need to become more responsive, and it's also going to need to become more selective. Uh, the currency of global... Right, just a curious, uh, selective in which way, Ryan? Sorry. Well, I, I was going to say the, the currency of global um, uh, construction industry is dollars. China is moving towards a current account deficit. China's economy is slowing. It isn't going to be able to splash money around indiscriminately to projects around the world in the way that it has for the first six years. So I think that there will be a learning process, mm. and I think that they will become uh, more selective about what projects they choose. I think it also will need to be more responsive to the, the request of recipients. Many of the recipients that we hear from in the United States talk about their desire for Belt and Road Initiative projects to be uh, more green, more environmentally sound, more sustainable economically, uh, and also more transparent. 
And I don't think that this is an area of disagreement between me and my Chinese friends, and I expect that when the Belt and Road Initiative Summit occurs later this month, that those will be themes that President Xi uh, lays out. I would be prepared to support and, and encourage that. Uh, from my perspective, since this initiative is not going to go anywhere, it's going to happen, I would like for it to happen well. I think that uh, infrastructure is a public good. If it's done well, it, uh, it can provide benefit to all. And I hope that uh, through this, these conversations and the feedback that uh, our Chinese friends hear from people around the world, uh, the initiative will continue to improve. Okay. Um, there was an effort, and it didn't gather any traction, I'd love to hear the Deputy Minister's thought on this, mm -hmm. to use the Indian Ocean uh, with the U.S. working with India to counterbalance the, the Belt and Road. Uh, first your thoughts, Ryan, and then I'll ask the Deputy Minister, is that really necessary after this has been written and there's 124 countries signed up to have a counter strategy to the Belt and Road? Well, I, I don't think that it necessarily needs to be an oppositional approach. Uh, as I said, I think the infrastructure can be a public good when it's done well. Uh, my hope is that, as this conversation has already highlighted, that there will be a little more clarity on the intentionality of these projects. Uh, as there's more clarity on the purpose and objectives of these projects, I think that uh, it will allay some of the concerns. In the absence of clarity, we're going to be left having worst case assumptions about the expectations and objectives of the other, which is going to drive this rivalrous dynamic that has existed for the past six years. Okay, very good. There was a peace pipeline, for example, Deputy Minister, that was going to link up Iran through Pakistan to India for natural gas. It's an initiative the United States uh, blocked, right? Uh, can we see the Belt and Road Initiative with China's presence now uh, in South Asia and stretching to the Middle East unlock some of these opportunities for Pakistan, do you think? Uh, thank you, John. A um, couple of times in the discussion and in your question now, the word India comes up. Now, because of the Kashmir human rights situation, Pakistan and India have uh, been through enormous difficulties with each other for the last 72 years now, 72 years in August. So, so as to whether, uh, and I agree with Ryan, whether we, there should be any counter uh, or whether that even makes sense, I honestly don't know. The question's out there. But as to uh, unlocking future potential, I don't think any country, in particular Pakistan, and perhaps I'm going to echo President Trump here, usually don't do that, <laughs> but Pakistan first, where CPEC is concerned, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's Pakistan first. Mm. Our interests are entirely Pakistan-based, entirely strategic. We have a very long way to go. And China and Pakistan perhaps enjoy a unique position in the PRI as well, because we've been friends and allies for a very long time. So CPEC, at least in our, uh, the BRI in Pakistan's perspective, cannot be seen as leveraging anything other than what we already have. We're building upon what we have. We're further strengthening our uh, historical friendship, which has withstood pretty much all the tests of time. Good. So Let me I follow up quickly, if I may. Sorry, sure. as I want to cover a few other of the issues here. Sure. Does uh, Pakistan feel more secure with the backing of China, then? Does uh, it help? In what sense? Well, you know, the United States has not hidden its fact that uh, President Trump and uh, Prime Minister Modi have built up a, a relationship. Yes. Uh, does it help to have China covering your back at this stage and being so committed to the country? I think uh, we've always had China at our back. And uh, where it comes to the India, but, uh, the India narrative or the India issue, I think with the latest <laughs> Pulwama incident that you mentioned, I think the world has seen for the first time. Interestingly, uh, and I can say this before we couldn't, before Pulwama happened, we were all a little bit nervous because in Pakistan, we don't win elections on an India narrative. Mm. It really doesn't matter. But in India, it's the opposite. They win or lose elections largely based on how, how they portray their relationship, their power struggle with Pakistan. So to come back to, to today and what has happened, uh, for us, largely, China's always there. It really doesn't matter that China, what I'm trying to say is that the CPEC is simply another addition in the layer of connections that we have with China, the friendship, the FTA, the CPEC, and more going forward now. We're inviting China and other developed countries and developing countries to look at us as a test case where international investment, whether it's Gavadar, whether it's the roads, whether it's in our uh, education or in our skills development, we want to showcase to the world that this is a win-win scenario. I don't say necessarily this would be true for other countries, but I think if each country keep their own best interest at heart first, you'll not find China an unreasonable negotiator or an unreasonable partner, but it depends on how well you do your own homework. Well, that's a fair comment here. Ambassador, a, a question for you here. I was in uh, Kenya uh, two years ago, I think is, is correct. Yes, two years ago, uh, prior to the elections uh, there. And the number one issue was the investment by China 
into Kenya in the Mombasa port, uh, the railway set up from Mombasa going to the capital of Nairobi, uh, the dry ports that I saw going to the Masai Mara or Lake Nakuru, the, uh, the roadways and, and the railways that were being built, I would think that would be a net positive. But there was huge concerns about the debt that Kenya was taking on, for example. Uh, and in the example of Pakistan, uh, should China be more sensitive then if this, to keep this out of the political sphere if this is a development project or not? Mm. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Actually, I, I was been to uh, there in Kenya two years ago. Two years ago, I went to Kenya. And I have witnessed in my own eyes two new railways. One uh, for uh, uh, the internal regions in uh, Kenya and another one from uh, Mombasa to Ethiopia to Djibouti. These two railways have uh, created a good representation for the BRI for the first time in Africa because in Eastern Africa, for the first time, we witnessed the creation of a modern railway. I have witnessed with my own eyes a great welcome by the Kenyans, and I believe this is in relation to the funding sources. In this sense, China early on has uh, uh, negotiated uh, with the concerned countries on funding and how uh, to increase productivity and how to increase the financial power of the uh, concerned uh, country in order to evade uh, the uh, debt trap. Indeed, as regards BRI, I believe there is a slight misunderstanding and some uh, critics on the Chinese real intent and what are the negative results of such an initiative and how we can circumvent that, uh, especially in a geopolitical uh, sphere. Therefore, we hear the voices of the uh, developing uh, countries, signatories to BRI, as uh, being uh, really applauding the BRI. As for the debt trap, China, through the negotiation with the specific countries, is trying uh, to find out mechanisms to avoid the debt trap. To date, no single signatory country at the BRI has complained from falling into the trap of debt. Since the creation of the BRI, we have said that this is an initiative that aims at supporting the economic prosperity within a country. It does not aim at expanding the uh, political and geographical authority of China and the world. And this is in line with the demands and aspirations of the concerned countries. It is not strange that some difficulties and uh, some hindrances uh, might hamper the BRI. We already know that. But thanks to a common vision, common principles, we are able to circumvent all that. Within the Chinese philosophy, if you go alone, you go fast. But if you go together, you go far away. This is the philosophy of China, a philosophy that is not imposed on others. And this is also the philosophy of Confucius. So we hope that through the BRI, we will be able to present to the world an effective way and a concept to build a more beautiful world. And this is the pathway that will pave the way for a world that everybody aspires to. Thank you. Your comments, so I appreciate that. Let me follow up, and I'd ask you for a quick reply because I'm going to get Brian back into the debate. Um, if that's the case, why was it such a horrendous challenge for President Ken uh, uh, Ruru Kenyatta to hold on to power? That's not how the Kenyan people saw it, as you know. It's a very sensitive issue in Kenya. It's a sensitive issue in Sri Lanka that uh, Ryan brought up before. So let's deal with the realities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people see you as the uh, you know, the bull in the China shop, right? Coming in, lending money, but tying people up. So what, how do you counter that narrative, Ambassador? Uh, actually, in, uh, in uh, some Arabic countries and certain countries, there are different uh, positions, uh, different uh, ideas about uh, the background 
uh, so about the impact of uh, about uh, BRI into their political affairs. But from China, with uh, one side, we think Minjiani uh, now target and. Uh, On the one side, we in China will not meddle into the internal affairs of the other countries. This is our initial intent, and this concept was really greeted a long time ago by uh, the uh, developing countries. On the other side, the BRI initiative has nothing to do with the problems, hindrances, and internal complexities of the stakeholder countries. China always seeks to try to find common denominators. It does not try to sow the seeds of conflict or to meddle into um, elections or to expand its political influence within the internal affairs of the countries. At the backdrop of this logic, if there are some concepts that are not in line with the spirit, with the core of the BRI, I believe this is not strange because every country has its own concepts and principles, but we are confident that as days go by, once the populations will witness firsthand their enhanced productivity, their better economy, they will also hail this BRI. And I believe this will further help in calming the situation, whatever the economic situation or social uh, situation may be. Thank you. I know there's sensitive ones. Ryan, do you want to weigh in perhaps on a Sri Lanka or why it became an issue in Kenya? Then I will open it in the floor for questions for the remainder. Thanks. Sure. Well, I, on the question of debt trap diplomacy, is the Belt and Road Initiative a strategy to acquire, you know, loan to own and, and to seize other countries' uh, strategic assets? The Belt and Road Initiative, from my perspective, certainly is not aid. It's not assistance. It's not concessional. It's commercial. Uh, the Chinese are charging commercial rates for the loans that they're offering to many of the recipient countries. That's not a bad thing. I don't have a value judgment on it, but I think that we should call it what it is. Uh, but at the same time, I have to agree with the ambassador. I, I do not subscribe to the theory of debt trap diplomacy. I think that a, a colleague at Johns Hopkins University did an analysis of 3,000 Chinese projects that were funded by uh, banks overseas, and they found one example that was debt trap diplomacy, and that's the Hamban Toda port in Sri Lanka. So it's the mm. exception that proves the rule. At the same time, I think we need to ask ourselves honestly, why is there so much traction for that narrative? And I think part of it has to do with the way that the Belt and Road Initiative takes place. Uh, typically with development banks, when they come into a country, the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, it's a technocratic bottom-up process where the projects are evaluated, they're assessed, they're over-assessed, they're assessed again, and then over time, they rise to the leadership for approval. The Belt and Road Initiative appears to be much more of a top-down process than a bottom-up process, whereas the, the leaders reach a understanding with each other, and then it is passed on to the technocrats to, to execute. And in the process of that, two externalities emerge. The first is the risk for corruption, because there's this lack of transparency. And there have been documented cases of corruption that have occurred as a, a uh, byproduct of these uh, projects. The second is a perception of indifference to the concerns of civil society in these countries. And so these are real concerns that I hope the Chinese hear and, uh, and can use to adapt and improve the initiative as it goes forward. Great. Uh, we have time for some questions. We have some microphone, please. Do we have two microphones or one? OK, let's uh, get them. Is there a second question? Because we have a microphone here. I just want to make sure that we can address it. It's there, so please. Uh, Thank you. Khalid Abuzar, CEO of Eurabia. Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned that uh, the BRI project is really an initiative for cooperation. Uh, the construction of the BRI has been uh, mainly uh, given to Chinese co com companies. Uh, when it comes to owning this infrastructure of supply chain, how will emerging countries that you go through bring added value to it? Uh, will there be a space for them and really cooperation, or will it be because you own this infrastructure mainly for Chinese companies to benefit? Thank you. Great question. We'll let the translation finish. Yeah, That's for you, Ambassador. And, uh, about the Chinese role in the infrastructure. 
everybody sees us as a kind of Trojan horse for Chinese construction companies. But in a host country, say if it's Jordan, if there's an infrastructure project, where's there room for the local uh, companies to come into play? Is there space, or is this China Inc. spreading its wings? That means if there are competition between Chinese companies and with local companies. Do you bring in local companies? Uh, not, not, not we bring in, but thank you for this question. Thank you for this question. There are some uh, concerns or questions on the uh, expansion of these Chinese companies and uh, their exclusive work in these countries. And will there be any uh, competition between these Chinese companies and the local uh, companies on the market? I believe this is a paramount question that has raised a lot of interest to the Chinese uh, government. And as you do know, the Chinese government always encourages and calls for the Chinese companies to abide by the uh, commercial and economic local bylaws and laws and to respect the uh, uh, local commercial regulations. In that sense, the Chinese companies will seek to cooperate with local companies. The BRI initiative is not only for the benefit of the Chinese uh, companies. It is an initiative launched by China, but to profit all countries. This is an, is an initiative then launched by China, but to uh, make it a participatory approach with China and all the other countries. We always uh, try to find some practical positive uh, uh, results. For example, in Jordan, there are some Chinese uh, companies and local companies working there. And some uh, local uh, companies are uh, complaining because they do not have a, a strong competitive edge or ability. And to a certain extent, this is real. But I believe the creation of the large-scale projects must be in consultation between the Chinese companies and the local companies. In this framework, we always encourage joint ventures and the cooperation or bilat bilateral cooperation at the managerial level or at the financial level or at the communication level between the government and the populations. This is uh, our main objective. And as days go by, we are confident that the rate of local employment will increase. In Egypt, in the economic uh, Suez uh, zone, there is a great uh, plant in order to produce uh, fiberglass. Therefore, Egypt has become the second productive power in the world. The first, the first one in producing fiberglass, rather, because of the cooperation with the Chinese. And therefore, thanks to this project, 3,000 new job opportunities were created for the populations. And only uh, uh, 101 uh, managerial positions were created for the Chinese. So this is the main objective of the BRI. And this initiative will indeed provide the new job opportunities. And this is our main uh, objective because there is a great rate of unemployment in the MENA region, unfortunately. Therefore, we are seeking to cooperate with our colleagues in the region in order to lessen this rate of unemployment. Thank you. Before I take the next question, one second here. Uh, you're listening, obviously, to what the ambassador is saying. Is it possible, Shandana, to have actually legislation that says it should be a 50-50 joint venture or a majority-owned Pakistani joint venture? Is it? reasonable to think on the Belt and Road that takes place in your country uh, that the Pakistani companies have to be guaranteed a space, or is that not realistic? Um, John, uh, we have uh, Pakistan's investment policies come from uh, the Central or the Federal Board of Investment. We have provincial boards of investment as well. But long before CPEC, uh, CPEC came along, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, Pakistan was receiving no investment, despite being lauded by the CIA website and by the EU as one of the most open countries when it comes to uh, rules of repatriation, rules of investment, ownership. We've all traditionally been open that way. Now, it would be a little bit funny if we sort of restricted that openness for China, and we'd better have a good reason for doing that, number one. Hmm. I just wanted to also jump in and uh, answer the gentleman's question and link it to what Ryan was saying earlier about the debt trap. 
uh, it is true that certain countries have these concerns, and you say, let's accept those fears, those concerns, and the Sri Lankan port is being cited as an example. Not wishing to defend China, but I have to quote with what I go through, right? What is my reality? And my reality is that we've created 75,000 jobs already hmm. because of China-Pakistan economic corridor in the most economically deprived areas in Pakistan. Hmm. Another 600,000 jobs are planned and desperately needed jobs. Interestingly, where Gavada Port is concerned... Sorry, 600,000 jobs over what already, time frame? What uh, time frame? That's fantastic. Or, or the entire time frame of our uh, the, 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 the projects, yes. The, no, not collaboration, the projects. In Gavada, for example, uh, it's interesting that the Gavada uh, projects, all of them are grants, they're not loans. And those are some key uh, projects for that, as I said, terror hit area. Mm. Where it comes to the port itself, it's mostly BOT. And it's not going to involve any sort of government uh, concessions or loans. So I think I keep on bringing the, the debate back to Pakistan that given that only 5.8 billion US dollars from the entire 62 billion US dollars is just uh, uh, um, loan financing from China. So it's important to look at alternatives. There are concerns, but there are also real life examples of how things have worked. And so perhaps, uh, as you say, the fears are good. Fears are always a wake-up call to what could happen. But at the same time, the reality must be, uh, you know, side by side with concern. Well, that's great. It's refreshing. We had a question from the back, if I may. Yes. Um, Hadi Fathallah, Namea Group, and also uh, Global Shaper from the Beirut Hub. There's discussion in, in Lebanon now that China will be coming in uh, to save Lebanon because we're already heavily indebted. And uh, my question to Mr. Haas is, is uh, Give, give the politicians a reason who have failed in the country and have, you know, have, are already uh, 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 heavily indebted, why not to accept uh, Chinese money? Uh, why would they not? Uh, and uh, for the Chinese panelists, uh, panelists uh, obviously part of this uh, uh, China coming into uh, Lebanon, uh, Tripoli uh, port, uh, free zone, or a free zone on the border with Syria, is to be involved in the reconstruction in Syria. What is China's strategy in Syria, and is it ready to uh, enter Middle East uh, 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 conflicts? Thank you. Great. Good, two very good questions. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I just want to be clear. I'm not counseling any country to refuse the Belt and Road Initiative. All I am trying to suggest is that we should have eyes wide open about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, and you raise a good point. If uh, Lebanon, Lebanon should have a choice. They should be able to have a series of options that they can choose from and not have one option that they feel compelled to have to take. I guess what I would suggest if a Lebanese official were to ask me is to be very clear about what the terms are where the risk is. One of the problems that we've seen with many of these projects is that all the risk is placed on the recipients. Very little of it is owned by China. And that's, that's an issue not for me to resolve. That's an issue between the recipient and the lender. Uh, but it's something that, that we should be mindful of. And if I could just make one final point before I, I turn back. I'm not trying to denigrate the Belt and Road Initiative. I think I've tried to be very constructive no, you've been in, very in offering uh, uh, suggestions of ways that it can be improved. One final thought that I would offer is I think that a degree of restraint by the Chinese would be helpful. Uh, it's great that uh, fiberglass companies are being built. It's great that jobs are being created in Pakistan. Let's focus on that and maybe take a break on strategic ports for a little while. And while we're at it, it may be helpful to maybe dial back some of the rhetoric about China pursuing development, not domination because it is casting the initiative in a very adversarial confrontational tone with the United States, which is creating a feedback cycle in the United States towards the initiative that I don't think serves anyone's interest well. Okay, very good. Uh, before I bring in Wen Ping again, uh, Shandan, I wanted to ask you that question, uh, particularly with Ryan's comments about how it's being perceived in the United States. President Trump, just over a month ago, said, you know, what's Pakistan done for us? It wants to cut aid, and you have a partner like China is like, we can't do enough for you. Doesn't it make it easy for you to seek the strategic support of China if the United States is taking this attitude? No, I wouldn't tie those two in together because President <coughs> Trump's question was uh, answered by my Prime Minister, Prime Minister Imran Khan on Twitter for <laughs> the fora. Uh, he the said, great diplo uh, diplomatic platform. Yes, he said, <laughs> we've sacrificed 70,000 Pakistani lives uh, against the war on terror, which was not of our making. We were unintended recipients of a different kind of aid, the ugliest aid possible. Um, 
and it's funny, where I come from, the north of the country, there's many people that don't even know what an America is or the United States is, but they do know one of the areas in my constituency. I, I was fairly, um, I've never been so disgusted by my own lack of problems as I was then. Uh, three out of 10 women were widows in that particular area, and we've paid mm. a very heavy price. So I think that question is, is uh, perhaps somebody misguided him to ask the wrong question of Pakistan, and it has nothing to do with China. What China and Pakistan are doing, uh, and, and it would be wrong of me to also paint uh, China as, uh, so, so if you say, a lender of the last resort. Uh, this question was asked earlier as well, and this has happened so many times in developing countries that often lenders come in of different sorts. We have development, let's say donor projects, huh? but money always goes back to the country that it came from, and this consultants come in. So let's look at it as a large, if, if that's what they want to look at it, that why is it that only China seems to benefit from it? It's not, we're a living example. Of course Chinese investment is coming in, of course Chinese, but Chinese have already been in Pakistan for a very long time. I don't know if you recall that there was a one-child pol child policy at yeah. one time in China. And I have a lot of Chinese Pakistani friends who speak the language better than I do, who are as Pakistani or more Pakistani or more loyal than I am. So our history shows us different side of China. So if people are worried, this is a great forum. Ask the right questions and you'll get the answers. But when it comes to, as, to bring, come back to your question, no, I don't think that question was, was a correct one to ask to begin with. Okay, very good. Wenping, I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, and we don't have much time, but on Huawei. It's so interesting, the narrative around Huawei, which is a leader, and then I thought the interview with the BBC by the chairman of Huawei was incredibly bold, suggesting even if the United States and Europe gets paranoid, we will prevail. We ha it's a technology game, not a spy game. How do we lift the cloud over Huawei and the, and the debate that we see internationally now when it comes to connectivity? Yeah, I, I'm also impressed uh, by the CEO of the Huawei, uh, his uh, interview with the BBC. I think, uh, you know, if you follow the story of the Huawei, uh, the, uh, you know, the engagement with the so-called spy the story, you will see the attitude, the response attitude is changing. At the very beginning, they are very calm, this Huawei. They didn't make any, uh, you know, this voice out, even give uh, an Oliver, you know, branch to the United States, saying we will continue to engage with the United States company, yeah, we will continue to listen to different voice. But later on, when there's a push getting too strong, and I think maybe, push to the edge of the limitation they can they can tolerate so that's why the Huawei come back saying now uh, yeah we are continue we will prevail and even getting more contract uh, because this United States make a free advertisement for this company all right so everybody knows the Huawei so I think this shows some kind of a very strong self-confidence about their own behavior. So when you go to the, when we talk about those uh, neighbor division, huh, division of the neighbor, global chain, and then we find the pyramid, and the China is climbing up in a very hard way. Before we are just manufacturing those very low value added, those uh, products, like clothes, like uh, you know, those uh, suitcase, uh, shoes, all of that. And then when you're climbing up to some uh, very key and the technical, those products like 5G technology, and then you are facing, uh, this is not glass ceiling anymore. Uh, that's the very strong obstacles trying to stop you uh, for uh, going forward. Of course, I appreciate uh, Huawei's this, uh, strategy, and uh, I think uh, now even the Huawei, the princess, now she's ready uh, to even lawsuit uh, to the United States government, uh, even goes to the Canada. So anyway, uh, this is abide for uh, with the local law. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the time may be on, on their side. I, I heard that Huawei has already uh, teamed up with a very strong uh, lawyer uh, from the United States. Uh, anyway, when all else fails, get a good Wall Street lawyer, and it solves a lot of problems. Yeah, there's a good business for them as well. <laughs> they yeah, got of course. The, they got a big case. Uh, may I have time to add something about? Uh, in, in 30 seconds, because we're out of time. Oh yeah, like this. Uh, I know you've been writing a lot of notes over there, but you have yeah, to save. Yeah, a lot of notes. Yeah, I yeah, don't I have time to come back yeah, to answer those questions. But go, uh, give me a summary in 45 seconds. Yeah, yeah, just one thing. I think this is that trap diplomacy. Uh, this has been becoming widespread. Actually, uh, not only those recipient countries are very worried about that. I think the biggest worry should come from China side because the money is Chinese people's taxpayers' money. So if all the way it's gone, disappeared, so the biggest worry should come from China side. So that's why now the Chinese side also pay a carefully 
those investigations about those projects. It's not that, that easy seeing all the money easily coming from the China. So of course we need to the like uh, the field trade provisit and also the all those investigations about the uh, project itself. Another thing is like uh, President uh, Kenyatta from the Kenya himself has answered your colleagues' interview, CNN, about uh, what their attitude about those debt issue. So according to his uh, point is, as long as those money goes to like a development project, it's not saying paying salary uh, or buying those luxury things, well, he's not worried about that, like that Mombasa Railway. So uh, this is a good trend, but uh, only that one, of course, is not uh, guarantee enough yet. We need also to build on other things, infrastructure, uh, I mean also like uh, industrial zone, get people jobs, they should have jobs. Otherwise, yeah, how does money come to pay the tickets for the train? And how the money can come back from those tickets collected to repay the debt? So you need to make those productivity workable. Workable. So that's uh, another thing about this job, uh, local job. Yeah, how to? I think the. Wingping, you don't understand. Forty-five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we need uh, to, you know, have another World Economic Forum. Oh, I know. <laughs> to Beijing. I have to make you conclude, but I appreciate all your notes as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to invite our audience. Uh, this is being uh, live streamed out, but also it's going to be on the web uh, website because there's a lot of fantastic analysis here. Uh, one I will actually write a column about as well for the regional papers. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all the contributions. Uh, I think we got to most everything you wanted to do, but uh, Wing Ping in particular. Uh, but a nice round of applause for everybody. Ambassador, Deputy Minister Ryan, and Wing Ping. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks.